Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Agnieszka Otwinowska Kasztelanic, and on behalf of the University of Warsaw Excellence Initiative, I have the pleasure to chair the series of six lectures entitled Current Trends in Multilingualism Research. Our today's guest is Julia Festman, who is a professor of multilingualism at the University College of Teacher Education Tirol in Innsbruck, Austria. Her research focuses on multilingualism on the individual, cognitive and educational level. Julia Festmann studied German and French linguistics and literature in Germany at the University of Bamberg and at the Humboldt University in Berlin. She then worked as a teacher of German as a foreign language in France. She did her PhD in the field of psycholinguistics and trilingualism at the Bar Ilan University in Israel. She also worked in the UK as a visiting scientist in cognitive science at the University of Exeter and then in Germany at the University of Magdeburg. Julia Festmann worked as a postdoc with Professor Harald Klaschen at the University of Potsdam. She was, she was then head of her own research group on diversity and inclusion and did her habilitation at the University of Potsdam where she worked at the Department of Empirical Childhood Research. In her studies, Professor Festman combines psycholinguistic and neurolinguistic methods for investigating the learning and processing of multiple languages. She has a particular interest in the effects of multilingualism on cognition and in the bilingual advantage debate. Professor Festman has published over 50 articles and book chapters. She is in the editorial board of such scientific journals as Frontiers in Psychology, the section on cognition, International Journal of Bilingualism and Bilingual Education, and the Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development. Julia Festman is also involved in research on language teaching and the idea of multilingualism as a resource in the classroom. In 2017, Julia Festman published a book called Raising Multilingual Children, co-authored by professors Gregory Porch and Jean-Marc Deval, whom we had a pleasure to host here in March. Julia, it is now over to you. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you as well to uh, the University of Warsaw for the invitation and for the organization of this series of really great talks. So I hope I can contribute to that. And I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Can everybody see it? Well, I guess. So welcome to this talk entitled, Does it get any easier when we learn and process multiple languages? Um, I must say, this uh, question is not one I post. It's a question by Raphael Bertele, who once caught me on my way to the airport, just on way to my summer holidays in the UK. And he asked me, Julia, why don't you want to think about and write about this question? Does it get any easier when we learn multiple languages? And, you know, in the mood for a summer vacation, I thought, oh, yes, I mean, intuitively, looks like it should be easier. So why don't I, you know, give it a little thought? And I agreed to write about it. I had no idea how complex the answer to these questions actually are. When I mean uh, multiple languages, I mean more than two. And in the end, after lots of work and lots of encouragement by Rafael, so thank you very much. Um, uh, I think it turned out to be quite a fruitful um, line of thinking and writing about it. And it ended all in this conceptual review article that you can find uh, in language learning in the uh, special issue uh, authored by or edited by uh, Raphael and by Jan. So Raphael, at this point, thanks again for all the encouragement. You might think, okay, what helps multilinguals to acquire new languages? Sounds like there should be an easy answer. You learn one language, you learn another, and maybe learning a third is then easier. 
But as Agnes pointed out, um, I did quite some research in trilingualism and especially in uh, psycholinguistics. So processing of a language is something that is um, very much to my heart, very important to me. So I felt that there's a more tricky question. What are the consequences of having to manage multiple languages? So this whole processing multiple languages might be something we need to think a lot more about. Um, I start with a conclusion of my um, review. I came up with five specific effects related to multilingualism, which may ease subsequent learning of multiple languages. Why may? Because this is something that uh, research more and more shows. We need to get away from this idea that all speakers are the same. And this is true for monolinguals as well as, or even more so for bi and multilinguals, because there are tons of individual differences that play a major role. We have external and internal factors which contribute to shaping the acquisition process. We have a range of factors which influence the ultimate attainment in language learning. And we have factors such as recency and frequency of use that are related to processing speed and to automated processing abilities. So this is why it's important to have the May. Um, this is the outline of uh, the five specific effects that I am going to present now. And I'm trying to explain them in the following order. We'll first think about the logic behind a certain effect. Um, we we'll look quickly at experimental findings, but um, I thought I do not want to overload this presentation with tons of um, references. You can find the, all of them in the paper. Um, we'll think a bit about individual factors and about changes and impact. So here we go, effect number one. So you see the little kid in the middle and for all of you who know about phonetics, who know um, how to read spectrograms, you'll see, okay, this might be two different languages. For all the others who say, okay, what are these uh, bubbles? Uh, let me quickly explain to you. My idea was to remind all of us how babies learn new languages, how they are confronted with speech input. And when I mean speech input, I mean waves. They are sound waves. Yeah. And these speech waves, sound waves, they reach the ear. This is why they are at the height of the ear. So if I have two or three languages that I hear, I need to find a way how to discriminate between the properties of these languages that I hear in my environment. And when we I have a quick look at uh, this French sample. Then you see that this is more than just one word. Yeah, this is like ou le minaret. This is what we, when we learn French, we learn about liaison and how these different words are put together. For German, you have a lot more these interruptions yeah, because of the, the quite hard ending of words. Um, so, the very young the infants, they already notice all these differences. They discriminate between these properties and they need to find a way how to do this in a proficient way. What we definitely know is that the input they receive is more varied if it's from two languages than only from one. And in a way, it's also less predictable what they hear. So it seems the children turn to a heightened exploration behavior, which means they like to collect more samples of novel information. They explore more and they seek more information. And I find that is a really crucial point. So my effect number one is a stimulation effect. And it comes from this variation in information in the children's environment. And I believe that this stimulates learning, but not necessarily to the same extent in all bilingual children. Some might be more stimulated, others less. 
And you immediately see all of you who know about language input and the different um, criteria that might characterize language input, that here again, it cannot be the same for all children. But the stimulation effect might be true for bilinguals and it might be just as well true for multilingual infants. What we know from experimental studies is definitely an increased sensitivity to and an interest in novelty. We can see this, for example, in eye tracking studies when we investigate um, how quickly children attend to something and how fast they are in attending to something new once they realized, ah, this uh, one stimulus, this is already familiar to me. So we know that bilingual children quickly shift their attention. We also know that they have a heightened and extended sensitivity to phonetic contrast. And this is in relation to the number of languages they have receive in their input. So what we see is an adaptation to the specific language circumstances in their homes. And maybe I could convince you of what I figured out from the papers I read. I felt that there's a very strong exploratory approach to learning a new language and this striving for new information. Okay, so this was effect number one, the stimulation effect. <clears throat> when we think of uh, children in the age of infants. But when we look at children at the age of kindergarten, um, I want to draw your attention to a paper that I published in Frontiers. It's called Vocabulary Gains. It has quite a long title. Um, but in a nutshell, it was a kindergarten where children were exposed to German and English in parallel, and where I um, led a structured intervention so that children were taught in parallel in German and in English. And we had two groups, a group of children from uh, international background, so their L1s were Polish, Hebrew, Japanese, Russian, and so on, and a group of monolingual children with German. Um, so in this intervention, they learned German and English. And what we found out is that both groups showed similar gains when it's about um, the vocabulary gain in English. But at the same time, this group of children with international background showed a superior gain in German. So you might say, okay, well, I mean, the Germans, they already had a head start. They grew up already with German, but that's not the point. The point is that these children already had one L1 and then when they were in the age of kindergartners um, and they had to acquire two languages in parallel. And while this one group was able to show these gains in their L1, these were able to show gains in both languages. Um, what I conclude from this study is that these children showed a very efficient use of multilingual input and an effective use of opportunities of structured intervention in both new L2s. And we could say they showed an enhanced learning ability, but of course, not all of them to the same extent. Okay, let's now turn to effect number two. I called it facilitating effects. Um, for all of you who are linguists, this might be sort of very logic. The more knowledge we have of more languages, the larger is our linguistic repertoire. And this is in terms of quantity, which means we just have more. We have more words, we have more grammatical structures, we have more sound patterns but also in terms of quality. There is an increase in diversity of information, for example, in morphology or tonality. And this large linguistic repertoire can of course be a great basis for positive transfer. There are many studies that show in particular a receptive gain 
you know, intercomprehension studies. And it leads us to think that multilinguals are tuned to a cross-language comparative approach, which means once you see a word, you immediately think, ah, does this sound familiar? Which language might this be? Have I heard about that already? And so on and so forth. So what we try to do actually is, whenever we get new information, we try to match it to whatever we already know, and we try to link it to what is already known, what we already stored in our memory. So this large linguistic repertoire might, of course, have facilitating effects, in particular at early stages of L2 or LX acquisition. Yeah, and these facilitating effects are likely. They are often observed when language typology is close. You know about studies showing positive transfer of structures from L1 and L2 into the acquisition of L3. But what we found out, or what um, in particular Rafael Bertele stresses, is that there are factors that come into play that help us to turn away from this automaticity we always try to seem to find. It's um, the fact that not everyone would actually use this large linguistic repertoire to the same extent. And the question is also, how large is this linguistic repertoire really? So Raphael found out that the size of the vocabulary and as well the knowledge about the world and in the same way the proficiency of multilinguals seem to highly influence how large this profit can be when we implement intercomprehension strategies. And of course, together with size of the vocabulary, we link SES, together with knowledge of the world, we link intelligence and age. So it seems that the older we are, the larger our vocabularies, and in particular, if we are highly proficient in several languages, then of course, we have great intercomprehension strategies and abilities if we apply them. But whether we apply them or not might depend on even more factors. I don't mean to confuse you, but now I'm going to challenge you. All what we've already heard, you can apply now. Um, I selected several pictures and the word depicting or explaining what, what is depicted. There are different languages. And just try to remember as many as you can. And you will maybe notice how you go about. There might be a comparison to languages you already know, maybe some of them are your first, second, third, fourth language that you've learned, so this might be easy. There might be languages that you've never uh, came across. You think, why, what is this unpronounceable word? What is this long word? So many, many things you might think that, you know, make you think, make you wonder. So I give you now just about a minute and you can try to remember as many of these words as you can.
Okay, I'm sure you know all of them now by heart. Some of them might have written down these words. For some of you, some of the words might be linguistically closely related to languages they already know, so it might be easy to figure out what they mean. Um, but maybe there are other factors that come into play. Maybe you prefer short words more than others. Maybe it would have helped if I told you that this word watermelon is avatiach. So we have different ways of how we like to learn these languages. Even others um, might like to remember words with a picture in the location on that slide. So now I'm going to present you the line of uh, pictures and you can quickly think, okay, do I remember this word? And I'll be silent for a second again. I wonder how many you remembered. Also, I'll, whether or not you were able to recognize the languages. So here's the solution to the riddle. So I try to put up this multilingual challenge for you just to help you remember how you like to go about learning new languages, learning new vocabulary, and realizing how many factors again come into play, whether or not you feel this is really easy, or which of the words were more easy than others. It might be the length, it might be how it sounds. I mean, one of my favorite words is just yetele, yeah, the ice cream finish or other words that were at the beginning of uh, when i when i started to learn hebrew they were just impossible to pronounce Kak, yeah impossible for somebody from, with a german background but some some words we just like they fascinate us and others we could just quickly forget again so we need to find ways how we nonetheless can remember so my third effect is called a catalytic effect. And it is about what happens when we perceive new information. Like in this example, maybe one or two languages um, I presented that, were, that you were not familiar with. Are we better, is it more easy to remember? Can we quickly form representations? Can we quickly retrieve or process this new information? So there are two review papers that I want to um, throw your attention to. One is by Hirosh and Degami, and the other by Montanari. And if you're interested in this kind of research, whether or not multilinguals are really faster at word learning, and here there were usually spontaneous instant word learning tasks of real words or non-words, you find a good review here and can get uh, an overview of the literature. And if you're interested in grammatical learning, you can look at the review by Montanari. Um, in a way, it's not quite clear cut. What we figure out from here is that there is an acquisition of new information that can be sped up in multilingual learners. And some of them do indeed enjoy superior phonological short-term memory or larger memory capacity. Others claim that it's not really so much up to the memory part, but more to the flexibility and richness of the phonological system, which helps us to be just more efficient when we encode new phonological information. Okay. Now we go to effect number four, modulating effect. And this modulating effect is mainly linked to the acquisition of literacy, reading and writing in all languages. 
at the beginning, we sometimes think, okay, formal instruction in particular, formal instruction of heritage languages um, might be sufficient. This is what children need. They just need to feel that their heritage language has a place in their schools and um, communicative skills are enough. And here research shows that the largest profit, the hugest gain bilingual children, multilingual children can have is if they are able to acquire reading and writing of these languages. So what um, the research shows is that children who learn to read and write in the first language and in the language of instruction perform superior in tests in an L3. And biliteracy has been found to be a significant predictor for L3 success. Um, we need to remember that most of these studies are um, focusing on L3 English. Most of the tasks involve reading and there are only very, very few longitudinal studies. But those that are out there and that I reviewed already in that uh, review paper, they show that there are further modulations that come into play apart from just being able to read and write also in your L1. Speech environment is crucial. The frequency of switching as well as, well as the language use outside of school. Parental support and the skills in the majority language once the children go into secondary school. What we know, what helps us in this acquisition of literacy and what develops is metalinguistic awareness, the ability to think about and reflect upon the nature and functions of language. And we know that metalinguistic awareness progresses in parallel to literacy development, in particular phonological and morphological awareness. So some say that typologically unrelated languages may trigger metalinguistic sensitivity, but by far it does not have these huge um, effects on language skill in particular in L3 and in metalinguistic awareness. So the, the hugest, the best we can do for children is really to help them learn reading and writing in all their languages. Okay. And now we come to effect number five and it's related to processing and to the brain. So we heard a lot about um, when we know more languages, when we learned new vocabulary, new grammars, it's a question of remembering this information. It's a question of um, representing this information, organizing it. Um, but in order to use it, we need to have a look at processing. And um, it means that the more languages I know, the higher the demands in terms of language control. So what is language control? I would define it as the processes and mechanisms to orchestrate access to certain languages, to also monitor lexical competition, to select target items, to verify the goodness of fit, to intention and target language, and to prevent cross-language interference. So it means whenever I want to use a certain language and I have a certain idea in my mind, I go about, I select the structure of the sentence, I look for lexical items that fit, I look for morphological rules and so on, and I construct my sentence. And this language control is like the monitoring that these processes are really selecting target items in the target language. So if I am in, let's call it the monolingual condition, where I need to now use English, um, my language control system 
looks over not producing other languages. Yeah. Um, so this is the idea we have of language control. But when we are stressed, when we are tired, or when um, the, the monolingual condition is not so restrictive and it's okay to code switch, then of course it can be a bit more loose. We can um, just use other languages as well. We can switch between languages as many as we want to. So we do have like, like the, the speech environment or the, the setting uh, influences how strict we need to be in terms of language control. So this means that this is something quite crucial that we feel that we need to learn to master. And um, the basic idea is language control works with these two mechanisms of activation and inhibition. So when we are just a monolingual, then of course we want to use um, words in our first language. We activate these words, we select them, and we inhibit other words that are not relevant in the same language. A bilingual and in a monolingual condition would activate one language and inhibit the other. But a multilingual in a monolingual condition would activate one language but inhibit more than just one other language. So it's two plus. And this is what I feel is really the special uh, or the, the unique difference and why we need to think about multilinguals in a different way than we do about bilinguals because of this complexity of what we need to um, manage, what we need to inhibit. Yeah, because for multilinguals, it's just more we need to be to inhibit than to activate. And this more need for inhibition and uh, more demands on this language control system shows us that it's just a lot more demanding. And this is why it's maybe easier to learn more languages, but it's not necessarily easier to manage more languages. What we need is increased cognitive flexibility. We understand that this is definitely depending on language proficiency and linked to our cognitive abilities. We also understand easily that we need time to overcome competitor interference and we need time to learn to manage multiple languages. So this is, uh, these are points that are really crucial when we think about children in, in schools where they learn several languages and where we often have monolingual, very strict demands which language uh, is to be used. Children just need time to sort out all this uh, language selection and all this language control. And once we understand that, I think then maybe we can um, yeah, support the children and not cause even more stress. Okay, so this triggering effect is based on what I said about um, all these, all these notions of processing. And we should have a, the idea of a brain trying to strive for efficiency. So whenever we get new information, there's this principle of convergence. And the brain tries to link new information to existing structures, to representations, and if this is not possible, then it will quickly build new representations. So learning more languages means it's sort of extending well-organized language networks in order to incorporate all new languages. And um, a very important word is this adaptation. So in a way, the brain reacts by adapting to these new demands, like a new language. And it can adapt in different ways. It can increase size of areas. It can also change structure of specific areas. It is not quite clear yet when um, 
or what triggers which kind of change, sometimes maybe even both. Um, but in fMRI studies, researchers do observe all these strange, for us maybe strange um, changes. We can um, maybe link this to this word neuroplasticity um, that enables us, you know, to learn our whole life long and so on. So learning new languages is again exactly in this line of thought. The brain adapts to this new input. And um, we need adaptation processes in order to manage language control and in particular to improve language control and cognitive control all the way long. So here are a few more basics about the brain, which I think are important to understand when we think of um, learning more languages. Whenever we learn a new task, it's sort of a trigger for the brain. It launches a set of immediate and longer term changes in order to meet the demands which are put onto the system. And as I said, the brain reacts by reorganizing structures, enlarging areas in order to adapt to the needs and requirements. And we find this no matter if we um, need, have a new mobile phone and we need to remember, okay, where, uh, where is this app? How do I change um, the loudness and so on and so forth? If we are in a new city and we need to learn how to go about going from here to there, all these kind of things, it's learning something new. And the brain gains more from learning something new than from repeating. Okay, I just saw that the host muted me. You're not muted, Julia. Now you are. You are not. Mute myself again. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So, um, whenever we acquire a new word, it means that the brain automatically builds a representation for this new word and for the constituents, which means there are new cortical memory circuits, which means that like I presented you before these new words, maybe some of them, it has an immediate plastic change in the brain. It's a very, very immediate change, but it needs to be consolidated and it can be consolidated by overnight sleep, but only Frequent co-activation of this information, for example, the picture with the word, the repetition of the word, looking at it again, the use of this word will lead to robust representations, which means that whenever we need to recall the word, we can retrieve it quite fast, or when we need to recognize it, this is an easy task for us, if the representation is robust. When we need to manage two or more languages, as I said, we need language control. And it has been shown that um, in particular domain general executive processing resources, such as the ACC are used to recruit and to strengthen um, these processes to, to be able to execute them. So the brain draws on these um, executive processing resources in order to execute language control. So the more languages we need to control, we might think the, more, the higher these, um, these resources are called upon. Um, the literature is here not quite clear, yet there are only very, very few studies. Um, in particular, there was the special tuning of one area, the ACC, um, that has been observed, but I think there we need a lot more um, studies to really kind of understand what is going on. What I said before is that the brain strives for efficiency. 
And this is why not always when we think, okay, um, it needs to draw more on resources, then it's like a whole burst and the brain uh, is, has a kind of overload. No, the brain tries to be as efficient as possible. So it will find new ways of uh, recruiting these processing resources. Um, what we should not forget is these other influential factors such as individual switch habits and language use, which have come into uh, more consideration of not only in um, sociolinguistic studies, but also in brain research. Um, so there are new models that um, try to incorporate switching habits, language use, and you know, socially driven habits and laws of the speech community, which shapes how um, our brain deals with languages. Uh, we also need to think of the flexibility of the cognitive system for switching, for relying on other languages for transfer and for fill up. So whenever we do not know a certain word, we have our other languages to maybe help provide some kind of lexical filler to fill up this lexical gap. Um, so the more languages we know, the more, of course, we can rely on other languages, but the more we also need to be flexible in order to switch. And then, of course, there are all the pre-existing neural differences, in particular in the auditory system. And one area um, has come into um, consideration here is Heschel's gyrus and volume and white matter density can vary to a, quite a large degree. And it has been observed that this determines multilingual outcomes. And something we often forget are genetic differences would actually in, uh, influence the individual differences in L2 achievement and in L1 skills. So of course, this also has an impact on our learning of a third, a fourth, a fifth language. And then, of course, some people just love languages and grammar, and some are naturally better at switching. So you see, again, we have, even if we think only about the brain, we understand how many variables we have here that might influence the outcome or our perceived ease of learning multiple languages. But as I said before, it's not only the learning of multiple languages, but also handling them, what I think we need to think about and what I try to do in this paper. So getting back to our initial um, slide, why I popped the easy question, what helps multilinguals to acquire new languages? And if you just kind of quickly summarize for yourself, you might think, okay, there was this linguistic repertoire, that we can call upon maybe a shaped or, or kind of more sensitive multi um, metalinguistic awareness, these kind of factors that we know from linguistics. And this means it might be easier to then learn a third language, but many, many different factors come into play. And one of them is that it's of course up to the individual. Can I actually make use of what I already know of this knowledge of languages. And this is for me a really crucial point because sometimes, and in particular in this uh, bilingual advantage debate, it seemed to turn into a kind of um, high expectation of um, children being multilingual and you know all the, the wonderful things they should be able to do because they are multilingual. Yeah? They, they were thought to be more intelligent and so on and so forth. And if we now think, okay, they know so many other languages should be easy to learn even another one. I think this is not a fair expectation because of all these individual differences. And I would wish that many educators would keep that in mind because Often we just assume that they should be able to do that, but we actually do not teach them how to do that. And this is why this paper by Raphael is so crucial because it sort of shows or it points at um, the fact that 
children may have the resources, but they are actually not trained on, it's not explained to them how to actually make use of that. And I think that education science can do a lot in order to help children to really feel it's easier to learn even additional languages. And about the more tricky question, I think, um, or I hope it has become clear that um, processing multiple languages is actually not that easy and it really needs some of our time. But if we accept the challenge, then we can actually process multiple mm -hmm. languages wonderfully because our brain likes efficiency. So final comments. I wrote embrace diversity. And what I mean is that um, I think we have a long tradition of looking at um, differences between monolinguals and bilinguals or monolinguals and multilinguals or bilinguals and multilinguals. Um, but in a way, every multilingual has his or her own acquisition story and equipment. And here come here, here all, these, all these factors, internal, external, factors and longitudinal changes come into play and we uh, I think I hope I, I explained it well enough of how much force there is in modulation um, once we think and incorporate all these factors and it means that these very simplistic um, comparisons and contrasts of monolinguals and bio multilingual groups are uh, maybe not so informative anymore. What really helps us is an in-depth look, uh, maybe even an uh, interdisciplinary look at it, maybe even a multi-methodological approach. And if you're interested in this kind of approach, which means um, that a group of um, participants is studied in more detail, in more depth, then I can draw your attention to two um, lines of study. One is a distinction between switches and non-switches. It was a group of Russian German adults. They were all highly proficient in both languages. And uh, the aspect in which they were really, really different was not language, but it was how many cross-language interferences occurred when they used um, either Russian or German in specific tasks. And I found that some of these highly proficient Russian German adults were really great at sticking to the one language they were asked to use and the others were not. And there was no point of language proficiency or anything related to language, but it was related to cognition. And those who were really great at sticking to the target language were also performing superior on a number of cognitive tests. And we even found differences in the ERPs when they perform cognitive tasks. And now I'm just writing up one new paper where we have um, language data of these um, participants, again, an ERP study. And you see that Usually we would uh, you know, just uh, take all these people together into one group and think they are highly proficient bilinguals. But yet, if we have a really close look at them, we can actually open subgroups and see how heterogeneous this sample was. And the second study or line of studies was on primary school children in the area of Berlin. And we, we investigated literacy acquisition, cognition, a lot of background factors, even self-concept. So um, what we tried to check here was this whole issue of bilingual advantage. Um, and we sort of um, realized that, of course, it is not so automatic. It's not just because you know more languages, then you are better in X, Y, Z. And I, I really invite you to turn away from this automatic uh, idea um, and to be more open to all these different factors that seem to be so influential. So here's my last slide. I thank all of you for your attention and 
from Tyrol. There should be a good buy in <laughs> Tyrolean or in Southern Bavarian. Fiatech. Okay, thank you, Julia, for, for this fascinating talk. Uh, we're, we'll be waiting for questions on the chat in a moment, but perhaps before we have any, any questions, because I can't see any, any right now. Uh, so can I ask you a question about your recipe for success in studies on multilinguals? Because when I, when I see this, this plethora of, um, of individual differences, would you say that your recipe is to have very large groups of participants? Or would you say that it's a very strict control of several different variables? Or would you say that, well, you need some hypothesis concerning the individual differences first and only then try to, uh, try to create, um, design your study? Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I'm definitely for a very ethical approach, <laughs> a very kind approach to our participants. Um, it sounds like there are like a hundred variables that we need to consider. And I think this is sort of really difficult. And in particular, if we do studies with children, I think that there is just a limit of how many minutes or hours <laughs> you should test children or investigate. So um, the point with the hypothesis, I think this is really a good one. So I think when we um, design our studies, we should really have a very close look at what which factors have turned out to be important in a specific aspect. So that we have a kind of um, legitim legitimization for including and asking these um, uh, questions about this factor. But what I try to show, and this is why I pointed at these uh, lines of studies um, that I've already done with the Russian Germans or with the children is that I think that it's, it's a really great approach to try to know as much as possible about a specific um, group of participants, because then it's not collecting data again and again and again of tons of people, but it's like investigating a specific group. And then I can easily find out more and maybe understand better but what works in the, or how it's working, which factors influence particular aspects. But of course I need to be aware that this is not really representative of all bilinguals or multilinguals, but maybe we are, try to not find that anymore, mm -hmm. but you know, to say, okay, in Poland, under these conditions, children need these and these factors, and then they can really learn easily German. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so 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 rather causal comparative studies with a lot of individual difference um, consideration, right? Yeah. Okay, we have already a lot of questions, so oh. I will start asking you. Okay, the first question comes from Martin Testa. Uh, is there a limit to the number of languages a child can be exposed to? Uh, I mean, does it ever interfere with normal language development? <laughs> okay, thank you for your question. It's a nice question. Um, what I try to uh, make all of us think again is that sometimes we tend to have sort of a very European view of multilingualism. <laughs> That's what I call it. Yeah, we think every new language is just a tremendous demand for our brain, for our system. It's an overload for the child and so on and so forth. But if we think of contexts such as India, children grow up with a lot of languages and dialects just because their families use and speak many different languages and dialects. So once I have a motivation to learn a certain language, like with my grandfather, I need to speak language X and with my grandmother, language Y. And with a cousin, this language, because they live in different areas, they speak different languages and I have a motivation. And then the child would learn that language with that person. So I do not think that there's really this kind of maximal number. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's up to a motivation a child has in order to learn a certain language and the input it receives. Because if there's no input, remember the slide with a baby, if there's no speech input, it's very hard for a child to actually learn that language. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Fatima Al Shamiri. Uh, in your opinion, uh, how can a teacher improve pupils' ability to use, manage, and control their multiple repertoire, considering secondary school pupils who have knowledge about the languages? So it's not about children, but slightly older. Yeah. So we do have the idea that uh, these uh, learners are more aware already of, you know, their metalinguistic abilities. They are uh, maybe more proficient in kind of understanding different rules. They have maybe different morphology and so on. And um, in the German didactics, we have this trend of um, language comparisons which means that we have like a certain language and we ask either um, other children to, you know, say, oh, how would you say that sentence in your language? And then we try to analyze the structure, even the writing and so on. So this is like including the children's heritage languages. Mm -hmm. The problem is always that teachers feel that this is uh, tricky because they do not speak all these languages, so they are afraid they might be, you know, getting into some kind of weird condition where the pupils know more and so on and so forth. So all what helps, I think, is to get a bit familiar with languages and to have yourself the attitude of uh, this is a multilingual resource. Yeah. So I need to of course, know about linguistics, about structures of my language I am teaching to these people in order to be able to under, to explain them really well so that they can actually start to use their multilingual or their metalinguistic abilities. I think in uh, terms of didactics, we are far away from uh, having a really good recipe for this kind of question or a good answer for this kind of question. But I think more and more people really try to find answers, try to find recipes, how to go about. It. Yeah, last, last week we had a talk by Yasone Senoz, yeah. uh, who was who was trying to present a recipe for, for that in the, uh, from, from the Basque country and had yeah. her own studies. Okay, we have a very long question from Rafael Bertella, oh. <laughs> who is actually thanking you for a great and rich overview. And the question, he has a question, uh, sorry, as the chat has just moved. Uh, I Sorry, I have to have a look at it. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a question uh, that was triggered by your recommendation on teaching literacy in all the languages. Mm -hmm. So Rafael is asking this, as we know, many or most language dialects of the world are hardly ever written, even if there is a literacy norm available. Yeah. So your recommendation uh, to me uh, ties multilingualism to a specific cultural model of language, a code that is used also in, in the written form. So do you think that multilingualism, as we understand it today, is indeed related to literacy in this way, and that pre-literate multilingualism needs to be investigated as something else? A very interesting um, question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I came to understand how strongly metalinguistic abilities are tied to this uh, literacy development, which is logic, of course, in a way. Um, and I like this view of um, metalinguistic abilities being tied to literacy. Um, of course, it reduces it to this kind of written languages. And quickly, we are back to our European model of, you know, national languages and so on and so forth. And we get into trouble with all what is dialect. Um, being myself uh, a, a speaker of several dialects, having grown up with a dialect, um, of course, I know that it's very difficult to think of the dialect once we are not able to regularly read and so on. But what we do have are other resources. Sometimes it's poetry, often it's songs. I mean, here in Tyrol, there are so many songs in dialect. And I have a good friend in um, 
who used to include songs in dialect in their German classroom in order to really contrast this kind of language apart from, you know, doing it on the, on the written, but, you know, really talking to the children about the metalinguistic abilities and trying to foster this kind of development in this kind of way. And it is very crucial, I think, because children want to understand how, for example, morphology works in the standard language and in the dialect. And if we're, if um, you are a child with a heritage language and you go in Tyrol into a school and you're sort of confronted with these two languages, yeah, you have the dialect, which you need on the playground and for social interaction, and you have the, the standard language, which is the language of instruction. So to be able to combine these two, so to see differences and similarities, I think even songs can help a lot um, and train a lot of these metalinguistic abilities, even if we cannot profit from uh, literacy in the way we would maybe like to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I was I was actually thinking about what you said at the very beginning about India, right? Mm -hmm. And and all those and all those completely unexplored places, mm -hmm. uh, multilingual places like like Africa, where people also speak a lot of yeah. languages, right? So uh, are those languages in the written form or are they in the spoken form only, right? I mm -hmm. think there is a huge lack of research on uh, on african and asian languages yeah. and and i think we, we we need to make comparisons there right because to, yeah. in a way we're not able to to answer rafael's question i would say without <laughs> without deeper studies in, in yes. those areas yeah okay there's another question from thomas bonk uh, <laughs> which is building on rafael's question yeah uh, Metalinguistic knowledge, for instance, predicting how a word would sound in a neighboring language, has been reported in pre-literate multilingual societies. Do children have to be taught or, or uh, does our education teaches them not to do it? So not to concentrate on, on neighboring languages. Uh, I mean, is it a natural thing to do, but we teach them that language Languages are separate from each other. Mm -hmm. And so to discourage this yeah. language. Mm -hmm. In a way, Thomas, I think you're completely right. <laughs> I do have the impression that we very strongly stick to this, I call it the European or the, the, the sort of nationalist uh, language uh, policy. Um, and you see this that we, you know, you have a teacher for English, you have a teacher for French, you have a teacher for German. Yeah, and um, there are movements that they are called cross uh, curriculum or, or language curriculum where um, sort of the idea um, tries to be fostered that you, you have a, a kind of a more general approach to language learning where you actually encourage these kind of links between the languages and this, this teaching of languages in combination, like what do I, I try to do in this kindergarten study. Yeah, we use both German and English in order for the kids to really be able to grasp both of these languages. And we try to sort of do it a bit brain-based, knowing that, you know, if they learn the word banana in German, they can easily learn it in English as well. And once they hear it often enough, they will uh, understand, you know, how you pronounce each of them and to which language it belongs. And children are able to do this. And this is why this first effect, you know, showing how absolutely smart babies are, how they, how they figure out, you know, how to, to separate languages, how they can recognize the, their first language and so on. Um, there is a kind of smartness with which kids grow up in terms of language learning and input triggers all these processes. Um, but what the school is doing then, <laughs> sometimes maybe not that optimal. And I would wish um, that many more uh, teachers really encourage more um, kind of um, trans language thinking, not only trans languaging, but even, you know, incorporating these comp comparisons, this kind of teaching them 
strategies. Also, what, what Rafael said, what is in their comprehension, you need to find a way how to really make use of all this knowledge. And we're far away from implementing this in any curriculum. Yeah. Okay, we have another comment from Rafael Bertella saying, uh, well, the comment is for, for Thomas, actually. Okay. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> he says, yes, exactly. And many of us have found dire systemic awareness without any literacy whatsoever. But literacy may boost such processes. I don't mm -hmm. doubt that, mm -hmm. says, says Rafael. Yeah. Okay. We have. We have. Um, I was. I was. Also, before I read another comment, I. I, I was just. Just thinking about um, Simone Feninger's yeah. studies on 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 CLIL and mm -hmm. bilingual education and the mm -hmm. effects of of education uh, on uh, on children and actually she, i think she she also found quite robust literacy effects uh, mm -hmm. in if children were literate in their heritage languages right. they were doing much better in 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 the bilingual education right yeah. so, which also strongly supports that boosting some some yeah. underlying proficiency some underlying skills yeah I, in I, her I, study yeah, yeah. and in her study it was even stronger if the kids were supported by their parents yeah yeah, so parental support is, of course, a huge thing, right, that they can get for free. Yes, because it has a lot to do with um, the attitude mm -hmm. the children have to learning and to what happens at school. Um, but even more so, I think, um, their, their motivation, you know. Yeah. And this does play a huge role. Okay, and we have we have the last comment because I, I can't see anything else on the chat. The last comment is, uh, uh, well, from a person whose name I cannot recognize here because it's just numbers, okay? Uh, I have no questions, but I wanted to say that it was interesting from a point of view of someone who likes and speaks a few languages but has no linguistic education. Thank you. <laughs> says the person well i hope it was clear enough you know we we so quickly start to use only our terminology and you know forget to explain concepts and things we thought about for for many years you know and we know where it's all written and explained but sometimes we just forget to explain mm -hmm. it. i hope it was uh, clear yeah yeah, yeah so i I, th I think what uh what um, emerges from the four lectures we've had so far uh, is uh, that um, actually we, we really have to make people aware of uh, multilingual repertoires, of mul the, the advantages of multilingualism mm -hmm. and on not putting languages into separate compartments, but rather mm -hmm. trying to enhance the power of, of, of the languages together, whether they are written or only spoken, whether they are mm -hmm. dialects or are uh, kind of fully fledged lang national languages, let's call yes. them. Right? But I, I think so, so. So there's quite a lot to do in in terms of of, of education, in terms of uh, in terms of well, making societies even more um, open to to, to multilingualism, mm -hmm. right? Because what you said about parental support, well, if parents are discouraged by educators. Yeah. or practitioners um, uh, and they stop speaking their home language to the children, it can only do the child harm rather than, than good, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 You are completely right. I can only agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I think there's a lot more to do in terms of, of research. And I definitely and I think it came across I definitely like this uh, jump from you know linguistic studies into brain related brain studies because I think there is so much fruitful cooperation there and we need this kind of jump in order to even better understand uh -huh. what's going on so that's why I liked my my Magdeburg study so much because we kind of for the first time I was able to do that you know, I, I haven't had such a study ever before. Um, so I think this is this is important. And of course, you have a kind of lower number of participants, maybe, but I think it what what um, comes out where you can understand is uh, a much more in-depth mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And this is what I, I like. And the other thing is bringing this knowledge back into education. Yeah. Yeah. So this explains why I am where I am, why I'm working there, because this is like sort of my mission. <laughs> yeah, trying to explain them why they need children with heritage languages, why they need to give them time once they ask a question. Because the processing takes time. And once these, these students understand this, I mean, they are going to be really kind of understanding teachers for children with other backgrounds. And hopefully a lot more open to multilingualism in the classroom. Okay. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the chat, people on the chat are also thanking us for, for this interesting discussion that we have had. So thanks a lot. There are no more questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being with us. You're but, welcome. Okay. And... Bye-bye. Bye to everybody. Bye-bye.